Hi, I'm Dita Taipala, and I will now give you a short lecture on atmospheric aerosols and the particles they contain. An aerosol consists of tiny, solid or liquid particles suspended in air. It includes both the air and the particles, whereas aerosol particles are the particles without the gas. Aerosol particles do not include single molecules or water droplets that are so heavy that they fall out of the sky. Size is one very important property of aerosol particles. The size, for example, determines if the particle can be climatically relevant or is small enough to be absorbed in lung tissue. The size of the particles spans over about four to five orders of magnitude in diameter and thus span a factor of 10 to the power of 12 in volume. There's no exact cutoff size of aerosol particles, but the lower end is limited by the size of a molecule, while the larger end is limited by gravity. Concentration is another very important property of aerosol particles. The concentration, for example, impacts visibility and can impact human health if the size and composition of the particles are also suitable. The concentration is highly location-specific, with higher concentrations close to particle source areas. High aerosol concentrations degrade visibility as aerosol particles scatter light efficiently. High relative humidity additionally enhances visibility degradation. In Antarctica, where the concentration of aerosol particles is very low, the visibility is limited by the curvation of the Earth. In big polluted cities, the visibility is limited by aerosol particles. Based on their origin, atmospheric aerosol particles can be classified in two different ways. We can say that the particles are natural or anthropogenic, if they are related to human activities in any way. Or we can say that the particles are primary or secondary. Primary particles are emitted into the atmosphere in a particulate form. Now I will show a few examples of primary particles, but there are more than those I show here. Pollen is a primary particle of natural and anthropogenic origin. Pollen originates from flowers. On the left-hand side of the slide, you can see a microscope picture of pollen from various flowers. Pollen also originates from trees. On the right-hand side of the slide, you can see a fine yellowish haze, which is spruce pollen. And pollen are coarse-sized particles. Volcanic ash is primary particles of natural origin. On the left-hand side of the slide, you can see a microscope picture of volcanic ash, which is also coarse-sized. Sea salt originates from the surface of the sea, for example via sea spray. A sea with a high salt content naturally releases more sea salt particles than a sea with a low salt content. Sea salt is cubic and coarse-sized. Mineral or desert dust is another example of coarse-sized primary particles of natural origin. The largest global contributions come from Sahara and East Asian and Saudi Arabian deserts. Soot from combustion processes such as car exhaust and biomass burning are also primary particles. They are classified as anthropogenic particles because in many cases biomass burning is prescribed. And when not, it's often like in the case of the massive bushfires in Australia, a result of anthropogenic climate change. The particles are fine in size, and the largest sources are from South America, Africa, India, Australia, and Southeast China. Secondary aerosol is vapors that condense on existing particles and new particles that form from the vapors. The origin can be either anthropogenic, by different types of fossil fuel burning, or natural, for example via emissions of organic vapors from trees. Blue haze which is depicted here, is a bluish appearance similar to smog caused by newly formed particles from tree emissions. The size of the particles is fine. Now I will speak about secondary aerosol formation processes, how new particles are produced and how these new particles grow. The first step is new particle formation, meaning the formation of new aerosol particles in the atmosphere from gaseous precursors. Molecules nucleate or form thermally stable clusters, which then grow. It is uncertain exactly which compounds participate in the formation of new particles, but it's believed that sulfuric acid, 
amines or other bases, and oxidized organic compounds play a role. Compounds are oxidized in our atmosphere, and when oxidized, they usually become heavier, and thus prefer the liquid phase over the gas phase, and they condense onto existing aerosol particles. Condensation is in fact the main path for aerosol particles to grow in size, and growth up to a few hundred nanometers by condensation is possible. Evaporation is the opposite of condensation, and evaporation is thus able to shrink aerosol particles. Particles collide and stick due to Brownian diffuse motion, also called random motion. This process reduces the number of particle concentration, but enhances the particle volume. In the atmosphere, the main role of coagulation is to deplete the smallest particles by coagulation into larger particles. We are here talking about particles with a diameter of less than 10 nanometers. Particles above one micron only experience neglectable growth due to condensation and coagulation. Deposition is a process that is relevant for both primary and secondary particles. Particles can deposit out of the atmosphere via a dry or wet route. Dry deposition concerns heavy particles that are lost from the atmosphere due to gravity and small particles that are lost due to Brownian motion-like coagulation. Wet deposition concerns particles that are washed out of the atmosphere by, for example, rain. The atmospheric lifetime of aerosol particles ranges from a few minutes to about 10 days and depends on particle size, altitude, and water solubility. Small particles with a diameter of less than 50 nanometers or so typically only survive for about one day or so in the atmosphere, since they are lost due to Brownian motion-like coagulation. The lifetime of large particles with a diameter of more than 5 microns or so is similar, since they are too heavy to stay longer in the atmosphere. Particles of sizes between 100 nanometers and 1 micron stay the longest in the atmosphere on average, as they are mainly being removed by wet deposition. The chemical composition is another very important property of aerosol particles. If the particles, for example, include heavy metals, viruses, or carcinogenic compounds, then they can impact human health. If they, for example, are made up of soot, then they are black and will absorb radiation, and via their scattering absorption properties, they can impact our climate. On the slide is shown a map of the composition of secondary particles measured in the Northern Hemisphere. We observe that the Particles consist of inorganic as well as organic components. The inorganic ions originate mainly from SO2 and NOx, which are emitted from, for example, industry. Ammonia, which originates mainly from agriculture, and sodium chloride, which comes from the sea. The various organic compounds originate from biogenic emissions, for example, from trees, and from anthropogenic emissions, for example, from car exhaust and industry. Particles can also include, for example, black carbon, soil-derived compounds, for example, oxides of silicon, heavy metals, for example, from metro breaks, and water. The fraction that a certain ion makes up of the total particle composition depends on the location of the measurement. For example, the emission of SO2 is very high in Asia and in the industrial eastern US, and the fraction of sulfate ions in the particles is therefore also high in these locations. Likewise, measurements from Hyudjala, Finland, show that the particles mostly consist of low and semi-volatile oxygenated organic compounds, since the measurements are conducted in a forest with minor influence from anthropogenic sources. Remember that primary particles may also have secondary particle parts within them.